things. Do you have your Bible? If you would, take it and turn with me to the book of Hosea. You may need to go to your table of contents first. And if you don't have a sermon outline, I do want to encourage you to lift your hand, and these guys will take you out and ask you why you didn't get one when you came in. Just kidding. They won't do that, but they will help you have one. Please lift your hand so that everybody can follow along. You will need one this morning as we come to repentance, coming back to God. Repentance, coming back to God. This great picture of our repentance in coming back to God is the picture of the message this morning. And so, I want to encourage you to think with me for just a moment. Notice the box on the page that is there. How many verses are we going to study this morning? How many chapters did we study last week? We studied three chapters last week. We're going to study three verses this morning. So, I want you to notice where we are in our study of Hosea. If you have your Bible open, how many more chapters come after Hosea 14? None. We are at the end of our study. In fact, this is the second to the last message as we come this morning. There have been 12 this morning is the 12th message on the, uh, on the book of Hosea. And there's been much that we have learned in this. There's been a great sobering of our understanding of the holiness of God and the waywardness of our hearts. And so this morning as we come, we look at this picture of what does it mean after all of this correction on how to come back to God. Well, let's, let's look and let's see the setting of Hosea 14, the final chapter. I want us to see this. Number one, and fill these in. If you're new to us this morning, this is going to help you be able to track with us. So you'll be able to get this. And if you've been here for all 11 previous sermons, this is going to help you be able to uh, condense it down and really see where we are. Number one, Israel was horribly unfaithful to God despite his constant love and care for them. We see that the whole life of Hosea and his wife and his children was a picture in chapters 1, 2, and 3 of declaring to them, like an unfaithful wife to her husband, here is an unfaithful people to her God. And so we see this horribly unfaithfulness that is there despite God's constant love. Think about that. He delivers them from Egypt. He cares for them in the wilderness. He constantly, he brings them into the promised land. He subdues their enemies. And over and over again, he is loving and caring for them. And what do they do? They leave him. They run out after other gods. You know, it's, it's, it's important for us to see that so much of what we see in the Old Testament is completely legit, stands on its own in the Old Testament. God working with the nation of Israel, God working with Judah, God working with the, the patriarchs of the Old Testament, and even the matriarchs, the women of God, in that these, these, these realities stand upon themselves, but they also point to a future truth. They point to a future reality, and we, we can see even in the life of Hosea and in the life of Israel, we can see the tendencies that we ourselves deal with as we consider how faithful God is to us and very often how wayward our hearts are. We sing about the cross, we have the cross around us, we proclaim the cross that shows the love of God, and yet with our remote or yet with our computer or our phones or our whatever it is, with our checkbook, with our decisions, with our mouth, with our hands, we can so quickly deny him and be unfaithful to him. So the picture from Hosea is we see Israel being horribly unfaithful to God. Number two, we also see that Israel has neglected or forgotten this God's word and law. We see the picture that they have neglected, they have forgotten, and they have forsaken God's word and law. We see that, that they, they've forgotten who God is. 
They don't even know the law of Moses. If you go back and you look at Hosea chapter 4, and you look at verse 1 and verse 6 and verse 12, Hosea is saying to Israel, you don't even know God. You don't even, you've forgotten what he's done. You've forgotten what he said. And I, want, I just want to say that like Israel so often in this day and time, we may come into the calamity of our circumstances and start to go, what have I been doing? I used, to, I used to know what he said. I used to know what he wants. I used to walk with him so closely. But now I've, I've forgotten so much of what I knew. When we look at how we get to where we are in this trouble, we can come to realize very often it's because we have neglected his word. On the pins that are in the pew back in front of you, all the little pins that are all over this campus, we have Psalm 119, 107 that says, revive me, Lord, according to your word. How do you get revived in your heart? You remember the truth. How do you get revived in your heart? You come to learn what God says. You come to remember what he has said. You listen to what he has said because his truth brings life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you want life, you come to the word of God and the truth of God, and he brings us life. Look at number three. Israel had turned to pagan gods or to the Baals. There were a few different Baals that they would turn to, and these were very, very sick pagan deities that were around the idea of fertility. And you see, in this day and time, not only, not only for the agricultural world that they lived in, that they needed their crops to make it, they needed the rains to come, they needed the seeds to work, they needed the pestilence to be held at bay, and they, they needed the fertility of the land in order to survive. But not only was it for their society and their food needs, but also for their families. They needed the fertility of being able to have enough children for their name to be able to be carried on, not just their name, but their family, and for the, it to be able to care for generation after generation. And so, instead of looking to God and listening to the God who created all things, they would turn to these pagan gods around them, and they would leave the God that miraculously delivered them from Egypt, and they would ga- go to these other gods that actually couldn't help them, but yet were so seductive. And so they would enter in to these gods seeking success and seeking sex. In fact, that is a clear reality of these pagan gods. Much of their worship of the pagan gods was in sexual immorality, all kinds of deviant behavior, all kinds of false behavior, bestiality, all kinds of incest and even human sacrifice, grotesque worship against the heart of God, and yet God's people whom he delivered would turn to these other things. So shocking. Number four, Israel had turned to not only to pagan gods, but Israel had turned to pagan nations. Assyria, in Syria, both of those for peace and security. When other nations would threat, they would go strike a deal with another nation for protection, or they would pay another nation for them not to be invaded and not to be brought into captivity. And so making, this was kind of like, you've heard the phrase, making a deal with the devil. That's exactly what Israel was doing. They were making a deal not with the God who could save them, not with the God who could deliver them, but Israel goes off making a deal with nations that do not know God, that we don't even, we hardly even hear about their judgment because we know God is not going to save them. God is going to judge them, except for in a few circumstances where he reaches down into Nineveh and he brings his word to Nineveh through a wayward prophet Jonah and a few other examples of that and individuals that would come out of the pagan nations. But by and large, you don't even hear judgment declared against pagan nations because they're going to get theirs. The judgments that we see in the Old Testament are against the people who are supposed to be gods, his people. 
And we see that's been prominent throughout the book of Hosea as we look at this. And I, and I know that that's part of the reason Hosea has been a challenge for us is that we, we like Philippians, we like 1 John, we like the gospel of John, we love the promises, and very often we gravitate toward those things which are good and we need those. But if we neglect the realities of how our hearts throughout all of history are prone to leave the God who cares for us and loves us, then we will miss the truth of the Bible. And we will repeat what others have done. So it's my prayer that as we've studied Hosea, as we've looked at them going after pagan gods and pagan nations and seeking peace and security in places other than God, that we would go, oh, let's not do that. Exactly what Patrick has just prayed and exactly what we have just sung, that we would look to God and trust in God when the difficulties come and that we would remember that he is the one who delivers ultimately and cares for us. Look at number five. Hosea prophesied that God's unavoidable judgment was coming. That is a reality that we must recognize was upon Israel. They were not going to be delivered by anyone else, and God was going to come and bring his judgment for their great sin. Israel was on its way towards judgment. Notice this, was headed for crushing, underline it, captivity and destruction, and then double underline this, so they may see their need for God. God had a purpose in judging them. God had a purpose in rebuking them so that they would turn back and through the ages that we can see that it is possible and that we should turn back to God. And so in verse or number six, we see that Hosea prophesied that God would bring repentance and restoration through his faithful love and grace. Now, admittedly, there's a whole bunch more of number five than there is of number six. If you've studied the book of Hosea a little bit, and if you go home and read it this week again as we finish, which you ought to do, I'm going to do that with Marcy. We're going to read it out loud together again as to bring it all to, to bring it home and what we've learned and studied. I would encourage you to read the book of Hosea. It's only 14 chapters. You can do that this week. You'll see that, yes, there was a lot of judgment, but there were also laced through it this thread that there's going to be repentance and there's going to be restoration, and we see God's care caring love that ultimately is pointing to the great salvation of God's new covenant. Fill that in. The new covenant with far greater blessings is coming. You're going to read, as you read back through it this week, you're going to read these, these hints of this beautiful love that God is going to restore, and it's going to be better than ever before. And it's because there's a new covenant. And where is that new covenant going to come? How is that new covenant going to come? Jesus held up the cup on the night before he would go to the cross. And he said, this cup is the what? The new covenant. Can you say that together? This cup is the new covenant. Let's all say the whole phrase. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, he says. And this is the picture that God is bringing about a salvation that is being fulfilled in his sacrifice for our sins in Christ Jesus. So Hosea is pointing to all of this. This is the reason, Sheridan Hills, we need to study Old Testament. We start to see the fulfillment and the, the beauty of the whole gospel plan, the beauty of God's redeeming plan, that through the ages, God was making promises, and then he's delivering on those promises. You need that when cancer hits. You need that when the broken relationship comes. You need that when the loved one dies. You need to see that God makes promises, and he will care for you and, and faithfully bring you through to his salvation as you experience the fulfillment of his word delivered. This is why we need Old Testament truth and New Testament truth together. Look at number seven. Hosea commands Israel now to repent and return to God. 
He's calling them to repent and return to God. And I want you to see with me the first three verses of this. Hosea chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Look what it says there in verse 1. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of iniquity. Look at verse 2. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, Take away all iniquity, accept what is good, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. Verse 3, Assyria will not save us. We will not ride on horses. We will say no more our God to the work of our hands. In you, the orphan finds mercy. What do these words mean? I want us to see what this means. As we, as we come to this closing chapter, the, the judgments have been declared. The lace of God's grace has been laid throughout all of his prophecy of 40 years. And now he's coming and he's ending with this message of, oh people, come back to God. And I want us to see this. Number one, fill this in. Hosea's command for Israel to repent is a precursor to the grand call for all to repent under, here it is again, the new covenant of Christ's sacrifice. So most definitely, Hosea is preaching to the nation of Israel at that time, 750 years before Christ would come. And he's saying, repent and return to God and his word. And he calls them to that. He's saying, you're going to go through judgment. Nothing is going to stop that. But you come back to God. And I believe that there was a remnant that would do that out of the, the nation of Israel who had rebelled against God. There were some who would be carried off into captivity. They would learn their lesson. And a few would come back and follow after God. But a big part of this is not just Israel in that day, but a big part of this is we see in Hosea that this great picture of the promised new covenant, the great picture of the final sacrifice is coming. This is a big deal because, friends, that's how we get saved in 2019, is through the cross of Christ. And so, notice here with me in Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, Mark chapter 1 is the beginning of of Mark's gospel, and it's right at the beginning. These are Jesus' first public statements. When it comes, look what it says in 115. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Now, gospel means good news, the good news of God. And saying, here it is, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, underline it, repent and believe in the gospel. So Jesus begins all of his teaching that he's going to do for the next three years, and then his sacrifice to the cross and his resurrection in overcoming sin and death by calling us to repent. That means to turn back, as we're going to see, to see that you're going the wrong way, and you need to turn from the way that you're going and turn back to God. So Jesus shows up preaching it. Fast forward three years. Jesus has preached this message. He has shown us what the Father wants. And then he goes to the cross to show us the Father's love. He dies on the cross. He rises again from the dead by the power of God. He commissions his disciples. The Holy Spirit comes. And when the Holy Spirit comes, there's this guy named Peter who was one of the apostles. You remember, he was the, for a long time, the open mouth, insert foot disciple. He was the one saying, Lord, I'll never leave you. And then, of course, he denies the Lord. Lord, you know, did, you know, this, that, and the other. Peter was always the rambunctious one. But Peter, on the day of Pentecost, stands up, filled with the Holy Spirit, and preaches this message of the gospel, not with fear of being killed, like he did just a few days earlier, before the crucifixion of Christ, but with power and strength and boldness. And he declares to them, you crucified the Messiah. You crucified the one that we've been waiting for. 
And then he ends that. The people say, well, what shall we do? And look what he says in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive, look at this, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, this is the new covenant, that all of your sins can be wiped away, your new standing, you can be made new before God, and His Spirit will come dwell within you. And so there is this message of repent. And in fact, in Acts 3.19, put that out there to the side, Acts 3.19 is another place where we see that the call is repent therefore and return, that your sins may be wiped away, and that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. I memorized that verse when I was in college, starting to walk with the Lord closely, and that verse has been so powerful to me over the last 30 years. Repent, therefore, and return, that your sins may be wiped away, and that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That's not only true for the day of salvation in your life, but that is true with every day of walking in fellowship with God. What do you constantly need to be doing? Repenting and returning to God. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. You see, the human heart loves to wander away. We're still in the flesh. We're still in this way. And we see that God's people continuously repent and return, continuously leave sin and run to Christ. That's the indication of a true Christian, that they live in repentance. And this is the way of the new covenant. And it is a lifelong struggle. It is a lifelong struggle, but it's not a struggle that you live in your own strength. It is the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit coming to help you, coming to do it through you. And so there is this big big picture of God's salvation. So Look up there at the top of the box. In verse 1, it says, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. And then in verse 2, it says, take words with you and return to the Lord. So which is it? I have this at the bottom of the outline, just to be clear. Is it return or is it repent? And the answer to that is yes. (laughs) It is both. And we see this as a New Testament concept, both in Old Testament Hebrew and in New Testament Greek, we see this idea that very clearly the call to repent or to turn back is a call to a really a conversion. It is a, it is a continuous repentance of one thing. To return to God means to leave the way that you are going. It means to leave the direction that you were headed. That's what you need to do. Some of you this morning This is the first time you've really heard this clearly stated, and you've been living your life, and you know that you've been doing a a life, you've been living a life headed in your own direction, and you've been paying the consequences of that, and maybe it's been fun, or maybe it's been hard and painful, but today you're hearing the voice that you need to repent of going your direction and turn back and go God's direction, and He gives you the grace to do that. And this morning, you need to do it. You need to, by his grace, hear this command and hear this call. So that brings me to the next statement. So is it a command or is it a call? Just so you know, that word up there in verse 1, return, is an imperative in the Hebrew. It It is a command. It's clearly a command. But it's also, this is very interesting, the commands that God gives to his people is a calling to obey. So here it is. Is it a command or is it a call? Again, the answer is what? Yes. yes. And here's one of the key define, uh, clarifiers here. Those who are God's people will hear and obey. Jesus said, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. They know my voice. Jesus said, those who love me do what I say. Those who love me hear my voice and obey. Now, if you don't hear his voice or you do not obey, it means that you're not his. So I would call you today to say, oh Lord, speak. Lord, let me hear your voice. 
If, if you will call me to yourself, I will come. And by his grace, he can cause you to hear his voice and come to him. Some of you, as you are hearing this right now, I call upon you to respond to his command to repent and to follow hard after God. Notice here with me on the back side of your sheet. We also see in verse 1 and 2, look what verse 1 and 2 says. It says, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. So these are, these are, this is Israel who is to be God's people that this message is going to. And look what it says, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity, right above the word iniquity, sin or transgression. This is when we miss the mark of God. This is when we transgress the holiness of God, when we, when we are involved in the evil deeds of our heart. But notice what it says, for you have stumbled. Circle the word stumble. I want you to see both of these. First of all, note, notice number two is sin causes distance. That's why we're called to return. And, and it is causing a stumbling in this life. So it's distance from God and stumbling in life. That's what sin will do to you. Sin will take you away from God. Sin will carry you off far from the heart of God, and it will cause you to stumble. So notice this, the need is to return, and the reason that there's a need to return is because sin separates us. Sin always separates you from God, and it separates you from other people. It's interesting that forgiveness brings unity with God and forgiveness brings unity with other people. If you can't forgive others, you can't live in harmony with others. Why? Because we're all sinners. We all violate one another's airspace. That's what we do. And so what we do and what we recognize here is that Hosea is saying, come and return to God. And why? Because sin separates. Number two, we see this in the second line, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Think about that. You have stumbled. Now, I want you to think for just a moment. Just look right up here for a second. Have you ever fallen down in public? How many of you have ever fallen down in public? Almost all of us. Maybe not all of us. Some of you have escaped that. <laughs> I remember I was in seminary, and they, whoever designed this, the library where Marcy and I met, there were these four floors, big, huge library. It was, in fact, it was the largest theological library in the world when it was built. But they had these, these study areas off in the corners of the library with big windows around and everything. It was a beautiful library. And that your Southern Baptist dollars paid for, by the way. Um, and so, very thankful for that. I went to a Southern Baptist seminary. And it was, it was, you know, it was a decent seminary. So, anyways, they would have these study areas that are around there. And coming up on exam week, of course, the library's full. And everybody's in there. And everybody's under stress and, and everything else. And I remember I was sitting there one day. And I remember uh, lots of people were sitting around in the various couches and chairs that were in one of the corners there. And they had some coffee table, what would be like a, a, a table, you know, around, a low table. And the, whoever designed it all, the, the decorator, made the tables, these, sto these sh low stone tables, the same color as the carpet. <laughs> so you know where I'm going with this, right? It wasn't me. It was this precious seminary wife, gal, who was a student, and she comes through with a whole load of books, and she's walking along, and she's kind of reading as she walks, and of course, she just walks right into that thing, and down she goes on top of it. Books go flying everywhere. Coffee goes everywhere, and not supposed to have coffee in the library, and you know, I just remember as soon as that happened, there were several things that happened. Number one, there were several of us that just kind of leapt into, oh my, can we help you? And she is sitting there and she's going, I'm okay, I'm okay. It's, you know, nothing, nothing wrong. <laughs> that didn't just happen. That didn't just happen, you know. And she's, you know, she's bleeding and, you know, it's like, I'm fine, fine. You know, so that's, that's like a, a physical example of something. You, you've seen others that stumble, or maybe you stumble, and you see people immediately try to get up. And maybe they're even injured. Maybe they can't even get up. Well, I want you to notice this. In verse, verse 1, it's saying, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. This is what sin does. It causes you to stumble. And number one, sin hurts. It will hurt you when you fall down. 
When you stumble into sin, it will take something from you, and it will inflict upon you the hurt of not doing things God's way. There's a second thing that it'll do. It'll bring shame. Sin will shame you. You know, that girl, you know, I don't want to be viewed as a klutz. I don't want to, you know, for me, you know, you, you trip on the stairs. I, I've done it here, leaving the pulpit before. You know, you gracefully act like, you know, nothing happened. <laughs> you know, you, you whatever. And, but why? I don't, want, I don't want to be a klutz. You know, I, you know it's, this, it's this issue of shame. How about, how about the next one? Sin breaks things. I mean, you can fall and break an arm or a wrist or a hip or a back or a leg, but you can fall in sin and you can break relationships that matter. You can break relationships with husband or wife or child or parent. You can break relationship with colleagues, with church members. When we, when we go off into sin, we can break many different things in our lives. Now, praise be to God, the antidote for our sin and all of its consequences is the shed blood of Christ on the cross, and that's why we need to run to Him and stay in Him Amen. and not keep running out in the distance from God and stumbling around in life incurring the pain and the agony that this is. Some of you would say, Pastor, tell me all about it. I can, t- I, I can tell you. I've got the scars to prove what you're saying is true. Friends, what is the answer? The answer is to repent and to run to God, to return to God. Look at number three. Number three, we're going to come to verse two. So look up at the box and look at verse two. It says, very important, look what it says, Take words with you. So when you're going back to God, when you're going to repent to God, words are important. Notice this. Take words with you and return to the Lord. And then here he gives a sample prayer. Take away, say to him, take away all iniquity, accept what is good, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. Assyria will not save us. We will not ride on horses, and we will say no more our God to the work of our hands. In you, the orphan finds mercy. So, what, it, what is this in verse 2? Take words with you. Well, there, number, th- number three, I want you to notice this. With God, repentance involves words and actions. With God, repentance involves words and actions that go together. Now, right underneath that, I want you to see this as well. One of these, words or actions, without the other, is worthless to God. God is not interested in just your words without action of repentance. And he's not interested in your actions turning away or acting like nothing's happened and not coming to him and confessing to him a heart of repentance. So just, just even simply stopping or even simply coming to do, retro, to do restoration or some type of reconciliation with someone without words of repentance is not true repentance. And we, we, I just want you to notice letter A here, the expression through words is critically important to God. Now, in case if you're wondering how important words are to God, look what I have in my hand. How many words are here? Words are very important to God. He's given us a whole manual so that we can, we can know not just the, the wonders of the created world around us, but we can know what he's like and what he wants and what he's designed and how to relate to him. Words are very important to him. His words to us are important, and our words to him are important. So notice this in your life, that expression through words is critically important. And here it is, he is relationally communicative. I know you don't use the word communicative very often, but it's a good word. 
God is a communicating God. He is communicative. And relationships require communication. And many of you would know that in your own marriage or in your own parenting or in your work relationships or whatever. You start to say, wow, communication is really important. And it's because God has made us cognitive, thinking people who are able to think in abstract terms. We are, we are not like the animals that are all around us, as wonderful as the animal kingdom is. There's just simply no comparison to what God has made us to be able to do with the highest order of the animal kingdom around us. One writer put it like this. Some of you have seen the, the tallest building in the world, the Burj in, um, in Dubai. Um, it's almost 3,000 feet tall. It's a gloriously tall building. It is a, a very highly technological building. It's an amazing thing. And one person likened this. He said, the next related animal to our intelligence and abilities, our cognitive ability, would be like the sidewalk outside the Burj. I mean, that's, that's as close as they would come. How technical is the sidewalk? It's not very technical. It's concrete and a little bit of steel, and it's right there. That, in comparison to, to the edifice of, of the tallest, most technologically advanced building in the world. I mean, there, there is no real comparison. God has given us words, and He is a God of words. In fact, He says, I am the Word. I am the Word of life. I have words of life. I'm the living water. I'm the living bread. I'm the bread of life. So so God even calls himself truth. He calls himself words. He is rationally communicative with us, and he has called us to recognize that. So through cognition and words, we can develop, know, and express these three things, the thoughts of the mind, the feelings of the heart, and the volition of the will. And so all of those are required for repentance. True repentance requires all three of these, that we would bring all that we are in our being before God. It's not just change our behavior, and it's not just say words, but it's all of these together. Look at how important words are in one of the great passages um, of the Psalms that has to deal with repentance. Psalm 32 is one of the most important psalms when it comes to repentance. I want you to see this. Look what he says. David writes this, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. And I've underlined it for you. I what? I said. You see, those are words. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And then look at it. Read it out loud, the bottom line. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You forgave the transgression of my sin. You see, God cares that you confess your sin. Now, there's some people that that's all they want to do is confess and not change. And then there's other people that they say, well, I just am trying to change, but they can't bring themselves to admit it. They can't bring themselves to confession. I, I think of the Fonz. You remember Happy Days? How many of you have ever seen an episode of Happy Days? You remember the Fonz? Hey, you know that guy? There was one episode, the whole episode is built around the Fonz admitting that he was, do you remember? A room. A room. He, he, he was trying to say, I was wrong. And he couldn't say, I was wrong. Every time he went to do it, he would go, I'm wrong. I was wrong. You know, if you have the Fawn syndrome in your relationship with God, you need to come down before God on your face and let him help you to confess your sin. Psalm 32 is important because it is saying, David was saying, a man of great sin was saying, I acknowledged my sin to you. And look at this, and I did not cover my iniquity. I didn't hide it. I said, I will confess my my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin or the guilt of my sin. 
Words are critically important. Look at Luke chapter 15, and I wanted to read the, the whole part of this, but just think with me a little bit and notice the picture that is on the screen in front of you. Um, this is called The Return of the Prodigal Son, um, painted in 1773. Remember with me the story of the prodigal, that there is a wealthy man and he has two sons, and one of his sons comes to him and says, Father, I want my inheritance right now. Just go ahead and give it to me. And so the father in sadness gives him the inheritance and the, the young man goes away and he goes living the high life. He's blowing the inheritance. And Jesus tells this story of saying that this young man goes off and he has lots of friends, women, wine, and song when, they are, when he has lots of money. And then when the money is all gone, he finds himself feeding the hogs, working on a farm. And he finds himself saying, wow, the servants in my father's house, house have it better than me. And I want you to see what he comes to say. Look at Luke chapter 15 and verse 18. He says, I will arise and go to my father. And this is Jesus speaking, telling this. And look what he says. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. I want you to see that Jesus goes out of his way in this story to tell us that confession is important. The young man is there off feeding hogs, and he says, I'm going to go home. So I'm going to return to God. Excuse me. I'm going to return to my father, and I'm going to what? Say to my father, I have sinned against you, and I have sinned against heaven. And so here we see Jesus pointing to the importance of how it works to come back to God. And notice this in verse 2, also in the box on your page. He says, take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, and then here it is. Here's the first words that are part of this that, that could be said is, take away all iniquity. You see, fill this in there on your outline. Take away all iniquity, iniquity is the appeal for God's forgiveness. This is when you're saying, Lord, forgive me. Take away my sin. And this is actually even a picture of the new covenant that's going to come in Jesus. This is actually even a picture of what Hosea is painting. That Hosea's great need that he's painting for Israel is that all of your sin would be carried away. Well, they can't carry away all their sin, but it is through the coming Messiah under the new covenant that all of the sin can be carried away. We see this in Leviticus chapter 16 in what is called the scapegoat. On Yom Yom. Yom Kippur, um, there is the Day of Atonement, this picture of a scapegoat. Two goats would be brought out. And these two goats, one of these goats would be selected and be slain. And the blood of that goat would be sprinkled over the altar. The other goat, though, would have the sins of the nation of Israel laid upon its head. The picture of a symbolic laying of these sins upon its head. And this goat would be a living sacrifice going out into the wilderness to take away all the sins from the people. To bear the sin load and to carry it never to be seen again. And so this little goat would be led out into the wilderness never to be seen again. And it was the symbolic picture of the Messiah coming to take away our sins with his life. Notice here in John chapter 1 in verse 29, look what it says. And the next day, this is John the Baptist. He sees Jesus again. This is at the beginning of John's gospel. And so the beginning of Jesus's life and ministry um, in his preaching ministry and his cousin, John the Baptist is there and John sees him coming. And so the next day he, that's John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming and said to him, look what it says, read it out loud. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist, the prophet, the last prophet of the Old Testament leading into the New Testament, is pointing to the Messiah and saying, 
This is the one. You guys, if you haven't seen this yet, the Bible fits together like lock and key. It is worth your studying every word of the Old Testament and every word of the New Testament. It is beautiful. God's plan of salvation is nothing short of absolutely, miraculously supernatural and beautiful. And it's for you. And so here we see John the Baptist saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of the world. We, we see this picture of whether it be the scapegoat or whether it be a sacrificial lamb pointing to the coming Messiah, this one who would take away the sins of the world. Now, look at the next part that we see here. It's not only about words. So letter A is all about, world, all about words. That's very important. Circle letter A. It, we, we, we must confess our sin before God. We cannot hide it, cannot cover it, cannot act like it doesn't happen. But letter B is the expression through action now that validates the words of repentance. And we see this in Hosea's final call. He's saying to you that, that, look at verse 2 with me, take with you words and return to the Lord and say to him, take away all iniquity, accept what is good. And here it is, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. Now, part of the picture here is that there's action that validates what we're saying. It's not just mere words. We often say talk is cheap. It needs to be backed up with action. And we see that that's part of what is here. The phrase, accept what is good, it, there's some ambiguity about exactly what that means. The part of the, here, the idea here, most commentators would say, this is the fact that right actions is the proof of sinner's repentance. So it's saying, Lord, take what is good. As I, as I confess to you my sin, come and, and take and see my actions of turning to you. Take what is good here as a validator that I'm telling you the truth, that I repent of my sins. And then we see it even go further. And it says, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. Now, this well could be a peace offering to God saying, Lord, I bring to you this sacrifice from what I have, and I offer this bull. The bull is slain. And with the interesting thing about the peace offering, it's one of the few offerings, it's one of the few sacrifices that the person who is offering the sacrifice is actually invited to sit down and to eat and to feast on that which has been sacrificed. And it's, so this, it's this beautiful picture of communion with God that experiencing his forgiveness and coming to fellowship with him, saying, Lord, I want to be with you. I don't want to just use you. I want to, I want to know you. I want to rejoice in you. I want to be with you. And so that's, that's the relational heart of God, that God doesn't want you just living here in South Florida, doing your own thing, running 90 to nothing, trying to have a little bit of peace here and there, giving lip service to God. No, God wants you to spend time with him, to come and learn of him, to feast with him. And so we see this beautiful picture in verse 2 that not only am I going to take words and return to the Lord and call upon him to forgive all of my sin and to, to look at what I'm doing in repentance and turning away from my sin, but entering into a fellowship with him and making a vow. You know, God's word says, when you make a vow to God, don't be late in paying it. Pay what you vow. Because God is a God of action. He, he made a vow and he delivers on it. He comes and pays the greatest price of all for our sins. And when we are called, we are called to return in like kind this picture of response. So, accept what is good. Right actions is the proof of a sinner's repentance. If you haven't filled that in, look at the next one. And when we pay, and we will pay with the vows of our lips, this is the idea of put your money where your mouth is. Right? Now, I'm not specifically talking about money. It may be money, but it's, it's action. We often say, oh, people talk. Talk is cheap, but are you ready to sign on the dotted line? Are you ready to pay? There you go. God calls us to be people who turn from our sin 
with action. Now, so words are important. Action is important. A.W. Pink said this, one of my favorite pastors, um, born in the 1880s, died in the 1950s. He was a great um, Bible expositor, preacher, and here's what he said, forgiven sin is forget, forsaken sin. Forgiven sin is forsaken sin. Now, what's the antithesis of that? What's the opposite of that? Unforsaken sin is what? Unforgiven. I mean, part of the picture here is that God's people are called to repent of their sin and to forsake it. And if you're God's person, if you are a person who's following after the heart of God, you are going to, by nature of his word, hear his call to repent of our sins and to walk away from it and to walk with him. This requires action. You know, I don't know what all you need to do. You may need to say, hey, I need to go get her, and then you go her and her, and ask them to come over here and pray with me and say, I need to repent of some sin in my life, and I need you ladies to pray with me about this. I keep struggling with this, or I keep struggling with that. Maybe it's some of our guys that say, hey, I, I want to take God's Word seriously. I want to repent of the things in my life that I can't, even as a Christian, I'm having trouble here dealing with it, and I need to confess to you guys that I'm struggling with this. I keep losing it, or I keep going back to pornography, or I keep going to this, or I keep going to that. I need help. In James, it says, confess your sins one to another that you may find healing. There's nothing wrong with that. The, what's wrong is when we don't forsake our sin. So I just want to say to you that, that action is important. Forsaking our sin is important. Repentance means that we have not only a change of mind, but a change of action in our lives. And then finally we see, as we close, I want you to see this in verse 3. Everybody look at verse 3. We see in verse 3, Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses, and we will say no more our God to the work of our hands. In you the orphan finds mercy. mercy. Put out there to the side of verse 3, just right out there to the side, a statement of faith. Here, above that in verse 2, there's a statement of confession and action and in verse 3, we see that this is a statement of faith. So number 4, fill this in, with God, repentance involves faith, knowing and trusting in God's promise. You see, the picture is, is that they're saying back to God, you see, this is all in that prayer, Lord, we're not going to turn to Assyria anymore. This is, what they, this is what they're saying to God. He says to them, say this to your God. We're going to turn from our sin. We've sinned against you. And Lord, we're not going back to Assyria. And we're not going to even depend upon special weapons like horses. We, we are going to say that you are the one who saves us. And then look at the last one that is there. or the, Yeah, the last one is, and we will say no more our God to the work of our hands. That's an idol. You may want to write out there to the side, an idol. We're not going to make idols with our hands and say this is our God. I mean, how foolish is that? But they did it. They did it over and over again. And so they're turning from their idolatry. And so what they're saying is, by faith, this is what we're going to do. No more trust, fill this in, no more trust in foreign armies, special weapons, or false gods. Just trust in a God of orphans. This is a God who cares and care, to, who takes care of orphans. This is a God who can be trusted for the helpless. You see, God loves the justice of caring for orphans. Don't fold your sheet over. Don't even think about it. Perhaps the most important passage on here is Isaiah 55 and verse 7. And I want you to meditate on this as we close this out and as we think about this. First of all, look up there at verse two. I mean, number two was sin causes distance from God and stumbling in life. Number three was with God, repentance involves words and actions that go together. And number four, with God, repentance involves faith, knowing and trusting in God's promise. Now, I want you to see this promise in Isaiah 55 and verse seven, written, by the way, at a similar time to Hosea. Look what it says. Let the wicked do what? 
Remember what we said about forgiven sin is forsaken sin? Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Look what it says. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God. Look what it says. For he will abundantly pardon. God, careful, don't, don't lose this thought. Listen. God calls us to be people who return to him, who confess our sin to him. And it says, this holy God will forgive us if we will come to him in Christ. Church family, may we be a people who repent continuously. May we confess our sin. May we put action behind it. May we believe that God will deliver on what he says. And look what it says. For God will abundantly pardon. I'm thankful of this that God has more grace in him than there is sin in me. And because he has more grace that he can pour out upon me, then my sin, he can save me from my sin. Will you repent and return to God? I pray that you will. Would you stand with me for prayer?